On this history edition of what's going on with shipping, the USS Kitty Hawk at the Battle of Midway. I'm your host, Sal McCoglana. Welcome to this special episode of what's going on with shipping. If you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Well, today, June 4th, is the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Midway, one of the most consequential naval battles fought in World War II. And I'm not gonna lie to you, one of my favorite battles ever to study. I kind of got weaned on the 1976 movie, Midway with Charlton Heston, read all about the Battle of Midway, had just been absolutely fascinated by it throughout its history. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about the Battle of Midway is some of the behind the scenes elements that play into it. Now, this is a, a channel about commercial shipping and the role it plays in national defense. And I'm going to emphasize that today because we're going to talk about played a role behind the scenes that were commercial vessels that actually were quite consequential to the outcome of the battle. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the Battle of Midway. So set the stage for you. It's June 1942, six months since the attack on Pearl Harbor. And while the attack on Pearl Harbor had been pretty decisive in neutralizing the battle line of the American fleet, the battleships, five battleships either sunk or knocked out of action, the U.S. had basically reconstituted its battle fleet. It had shifted the three New Mexico class battleships from the East Coast, it brought the Colorado out of the West Coast yards, and we're reinforcing them with two brand new battleships, the North Carolina and the Washington. However, in the meantime, the Japanese onslaught had been absolutely unstoppable. For nearly six months, the Japanese had been running unchecked, particularly the strike force that had hit Pearl Harbor, the Kido Butai, the six aircraft carriers, the Akagi, the Kaga, Hiryu, Soryu, Shikukaku, and Zuikaku had been running around everywhere. They had been at Pearl Harbor. Part of them peeled off to do the attack on Wake Island. They attacked Rabaul. They attacked Darwin. They attacked the Dutch East Indies. They were in the Indian Ocean. They were at the Battle of Coral Sea. And now here they are heading for Midway. Now, they have suffered some issues on the way. At Coral Sea in May of 1942, a section of Kidu Butai, Carrier Division 5, the Shokaku and the Zuikaku, encountered two American aircraft carriers, the Lexington and the Yorktown. Shokaku was damaged. Three bomb hits knocked her out of damage. The Zuikaku lost a good chunk of her air group. So Carrier Division 5, one third of the Kito Butai would not be available for the Midway operation. On the American side, Carrier Saratoga took a torpedo hit in January of 42. She was just coming out of the repair docks on the west coast of the United States and would miss the Battle of Midway. Lexington would be sunk at the Battle of Coral Sea, and the Yorktown had been damaged but would be patched up just sufficiently to fight at the Battle of Midway. And Midway was seen as being very decisive. What Admiral Yamamoto, Izoruko Yamamoto, wanted to do was fight a major battle. But unfortunately, his objectives got clouded into the overall campaign. He wanted to destroy the American Pacific fleet, but at the same time capture Midway. And in many ways, he let the capture of Midway trump the destruction of the American fleet. Plus, you have the American advantage of intelligence. The Americans had been able to crack part of the code, had a good idea where the Japanese were coming from. And so the Americans were able to lie in wait for the Japanese fleet and fight the most decisive battle in the Pacific War in 1942. Now, it's not obviously the end of World War II, still got three more years of fighting going in, but it really neutralizes the Japanese offensive at this point, the loss of four aircraft carriers to the loss of one American. And when you look at the lineup of the fleets, it's an impressive array. This is a, a good a summation of the ships that were brought to bear that are going to be fought here. But what's missing from here is a couple of key ships, ships that I think are absolutely essential to understand how you fight this battle. We've got the aircraft carriers, we've got battleships and cruisers and destroyers and submarines and aircraft, and all those key things are there. But understand what keeps those ships moving are the logistics behind the fleet, the ability to keep these units moving by fuel and by supplies. And if you look at the order of battle for the US fleet, which is what we're gonna focus on here, you see a couple of things missing. So supporting the carrier strike groups, Task Force 16 and 17, made up of Yorktown, Enterprise, and Hornet, there are two 
Oilers, the Cimarron and the Platt. They are two of five Cimarron class Oilers that are in the Pacific fleet that are going to provide the fast fuel needed for this groups. These were a dozen vessels, Cimarron T3 class tankers built commercially, built under the Merch Marine Act of 1936. They are built, they're actually hulls number two through 13 of the first 50 ships built under the Merch Marine Act of 1936. They're going to be taken over by the Navy and converted into fast oilers. These ships had been built with modifications. Instead of single screws, one propeller, they had two larger engines capable of speeds up to 18 knots. They carry nearly twice as much fuel as previous Navy oilers. And they were absolutely essential to keep the American fast carrier task forces at sea. At this time, the Americans have five of these oilers in the Pacific. They just lost one, a sixth one, down at Coral Sea with the loss of Neosho. But they have five. Two of them are going to be supporting the fast carrier task forces. That's Cimarron and Platt. Another one, the Guadalupe, is going to be supporting Midway because of the anticipated number of air operations that are going to be cycling out. Remember, Admiral Nimitz has made Midway his fourth aircraft carrier. He has stacked it full of aircraft, B-17s, B-26s, TBF Avengers, SBDs, Vindicators, F-4F Wildcats, F-2A Buffaloes, you name it, PBY Catalinas. He has stacked Midway till it's basically the island was about to sink. But to do that, you need fuel. And so he's brought the third of the fifth oilers there. That is Guadalupe. The fourth of the fifth oilers is down with, or excuse me, I should say up, with Task Force 8, and that is supporting the Aleutian operations. Uh, a large cruiser task force has been sent under Rear Admiral Thibault up to the Aleutians to counter the Japanese, uh, a force of two heavy cruisers, three light cruisers, and a squadron of destroyers up there to do it. That's going to require an oiler task force, and so he sends the fourth of his five fast oilers, the Sabine, up there along with the smaller oiler to provide the fuel necessary to keep that task force at sea. The only other oiler he has left is the Kaskakia, which is basically shuttling oil from the West Coast to Pearl Harbor to keep the Pearl Harbor tanks full. Those oilers are absolutely essential to keep the Americans at sea and sustain them in this upcoming operation. But that's not the merchant ship I want to talk about with you today. The one I want to talk about is one that is taken into the U.S. Navy, commissioned as the USS Kitty Hawk. Now, Kitty Hawk is a pretty significant name right now because of a recent news story. This is USS Kitty Hawk, CV-63, arriving in Brownsville, Texas, just past week. She had just completed a four-month tow from Bremerton, Washington, all the way around the west coast of the Americas, around the very southern tip of South America, and then up the east coast of the Americas, and now arrives in Brownsville, Texas for scrapping. She was a supercarrier. She was one of the supercarriers built post-World War II, conventionally fueled carrier that operated throughout the Cold War and into the period post-Cold War. Matter of fact, Kitty Hawk was essentially used as a staging platform for special operations forces during the operation in Afghanistan in 2001. We're not talking about this Kitty Hawk. We're talking about her precursor namesake, which is going to provide important actions at the Battle of Midway. This is Midway. Uh, Midway is not an island. It's an atoll. Uh, it's made up of a series of islands. Those islands together can constitute Midway. There's Sand Island here on the west side and then Eastern Island on the east side. Here's an image of uh, those islands from the time of World War II. You can see how much the airfield dominates those islands and how important they are to the operations of the base. The first sighting of Midway Island was back in 1859 from a ship called the Gambia. The captain on board, a captain by the name of Brooks, referred to this island as Middlebrook Island. And the island was claimed by the United States under a very unique act that had been passed a few years earlier in 1856 
known as the Guano Islands Act. Uh, guano, which is basically bird and pat, uh, bat poop, is full of nitrates, very good for fertilizer and for use in many other things. And under the Guano Island Act of 1856, it gave Americans the right to occupy uninhabited islands and to claim them for the United States. So in 1859, the U.S. lays claim to the isle, what becomes Midway Islands or Midway Atoll, uh, all because of bird shit. So sorry, but that's basically what it is. Uh, in 1867, Captain William McReynolds, uh, William Reynolds of the USS Lackawanna formally took possession of the atoll and changed its name to Midway. In 1870, the Pacific Mail Steamship Company started a project of dredging a channel in order to establish a coaling facility since the island was about midway across the Pacific. The project did not turn out very good, and so basically it proved to be a failure. By the early 20th century, Midway Island became important as a waypoint for the Pacific Cable Company. Uh, they laid cables across the Pacific. This is the way we still communicate today by submarine cables. And this Trans-Pacific telegra uh, Telegraph Cable was laid to the island as a Midway point. You really see Midway develop in the mid-1930s when Pan American Company, Pan Am in 1935, established it as a waypoint station for its famous China Clippers, the big uh, flying boats that would transition from or fly from the west coast of the United States all the way to Manila in the Philippines. Midway obviously took more of an importance as World War II loomed on the horizon, and the United States Navy decided to develop it as a naval air station. When the Japanese struck at Pearl Harbor in 1941, December 7th, the USS Lexington, one of two aircraft carriers based out of Pearl Harbor at the time, the third, the Saratoga was on the West Coast, was en route to Midway with a squadron of dive bombers on board. This squadron of dive bombers, Vindicator SB2Us, was going to be based on Midway for scouting purposes. Because of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Lexington doesn't deliver them initially to Midway. She takes part in searches for the Japanese fleet, but eventually will land there. And the Americans begin a process of reinforcing Midway Island with what were called Marine Defense Battalions. These were units set up to defend the islands very similar to Midway, Wake Island, Guam, and these islands throughout the Pacific. And Midway starts acquiring defenses as the war progresses. By May of 1942, the plan becomes clear that the Japanese are going to launch an attack against Midway Island. And this is where the ship that is the subject of today's video comes in, the USS Kitty Hawk. Kitty Hawk began her career in 1932 as the SSC Train New York. Built at the Sun Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company in Chester, Pennsylvania, she was one of two vessels built for the Sea Train Company that was used to haul fully loaded railway cars from the United States to Cuba. You'll notice there's a notch here in the center of the vessel. And what this notch is, it gives you access to the interior of the vessel and you can bring fully loaded railway cars. And on a pair of tracks that run the length of the vessel, you can load fully loaded railway cars, push them back to the stern or up forward to the bow and store them on a series of decks. There are actually two decks here, or two decks that you could load these vehicles, uh, these uh, railway cars on. And so sea trains, as they were known, this style of vessel was known as sea train, provided these large voluminous cargo spaces to move these railway cars. Well, in 1941, 25 June of 1941, the U.S. Navy takes over the sea train New York along with her sister ship and convert them into what they call APVs, these aircraft transports. And USS Kitty Hawk and her sister ship, the Hammondsport, is brought into the U.S. Navy. She's commissioned on 26 November 1941, and she departs New York on 16 December 1941 for Hawaii via Panama Canal. And her first mission is to replace aircraft that had been lost. What was found is that these big, large areas that could accommodate railway cars were perfect for storing aircraft on board. And so the vessel was converted over. And so she became USS Kitty Hawk. She's fitted with a series of cranes 
that are being going to be able to use to basically self-sustain herself, to offload herself. You can see how she's built and how she's modified to be able to carry those railway cars on board. And you can actually see several aircraft here on the after deck of her. And this is actually a better image loaded down with the uh, aircraft on the weather deck and some vehicles and other equipment in the interior of the ship with the cranes on board being able to be used. She arrived at Pearl Harbor on 8 February of 1942, offloaded her aircraft to Hickam Field, and then returned back to the mainland for a series of uh, runs to reinforce the Hawaiian Islands. But with the attack against Midway looming on the horizon, she's diverted and she's going to start loading equipment for the 3rd Marine Defense Battalion, along with elements of Marine Air Group 21 and 45. And specifically, she's going to load F4F, Wildcats, SBD-2 dive bombers, and other aircraft needed for Midway. This is actually her right here loading some additional aircraft. Those are F2A Buffaloes that are reinforcing the fighter squadron that was initially destined for Wake Island on board the USS Saratoga, but was eventually deposited on Midway. And Kitty Hawk's arrival just prior to the battle was really essential. She comes in bringing in this needed aircraft, Marine defense units. Uh, the light cruiser Nashville will also load some equipment on board, make a quick run to the island. But Kitty Hawk deposited its, much of the aircraft that's going to be used by the Marines, along with some of the key defense material that's going to be used. Prior to the arrival of Kitty Hawk, some other vessels of the U.S. Navy, former Hog Island class freighters will arrive, bringing artillery, including shore defense artillery and anti-aircraft artillery to be used. And at the Battle of Midway, these fighters are going to be used to help defend Midway. Now, while they get pretty much destroyed by the Japanese onslaught, the fact that Midway packs such a potent punch that it is the fourth aircraft carrier, it forces Admiral Nagumo to launch his early morning strike against Midway. That early morning strike against Midway will take half of the aircraft off the aircraft carriers, the four aircraft carriers that are with Admiral Nagumo, they're going to go lunging at Midway. He's going to be unable to knock out Midway, even though we, there's a lot of talk about the success of that airstrike. It's not really that successful. Doesn't knock out the runways, doesn't knock out the fuel tanks. It damages them severely, but not everything. And most importantly, Midway still exists as a threat to him so that when that airstrike is coming back, he orders the second half of aircraft he have on board to be restowed and re-equipped to attack Midway for a second strike. And it's in the midst of that rearmament that he gets hit by aircraft from both Midway and then from Enterprise, Hornet, and Yorktown that results eventually in the loss of three aircraft carriers Akagi, Kaga, and Soryu, and then later in the day, the Hiryu will be sunk. And so USS Kitty Hawk plays an instrumental role, I will argue, in this battle. The fact that she's able to run those aircraft to Midway to reinforce Pearl Harbor shortly after the attack, to bring in elements of the 3rd Marine Defense Battalion, and the fact that five of the six oilers coming out there are able to sustain both the Fast Carrier Task Force, Task Force 8 up in the Aleutians, Midway, and then run fuel from the Pacific, from the Pacific West Coast back to Pearl Harbor, all play a vital role in the Battle of Midway. Kitty Hawk goes on to continue her service throughout the Pacific in August of 1942. She brings the Marine Air Group that's going to go to Guadalcanal down to the Pacific. She transfers them on board the light, uh, the escort carrier USS Long Island so that the Long Island can ferry them to Guadalcanal in August of 1942. And one of the things that I hope to convey by this, obviously, you know, the, the Kitty Hawk doesn't play as decisive a role as Enterprise, Hornet, or Yorktown in the battle. However, the Oilers of the Cimarron class, Kitty Hawk, the former Sea Train New York, all play a vital, essential role. And it's not just the striking power of three aircraft carriers that's the important element, but it's a lot of the logistics, the support, and the fact that the U.S. Navy could call upon the Merchant Marine to reinforce them with fast oilers, with ships like 
the Kitty Hawk to allow them to be able to move fuel and aircraft around the Pacific as readily as they could is an essential element for eventual success at Midway. I hope you enjoyed our little bit of history today on what's going on with shipping. Again, love to throw in these little historical elements here and there, but our main focus is talking about what's going on with global shipping. And to do that, please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, share it across social media. And if you can, head on over to our Patreon page, give us our support. We've got some great patrons who support our channel. Again, the likes of James uh, Bianco, uh, Jay Mintzmeyer, uh, you know, there's some great guys on there and women on there who support this channel. And I appreciate them all the time for giving their support. Also included a new button so that you can provide support just immediately. If you just want to give a one-time offer, you can do that on the uh, link below. You can go ahead and do that in the description page, a little bit of a super thanks for the video. But until our next video, this is Sal signing off.